thanks very much. You made me much younger than I am. My PhD was actually 1988, so back in the dark oh. ages. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, so thanks, Gemma. That was a great talk that you gave. And so um, I, I thought there might be some double up. So I hope if I double up, I'll um, just uh, whiz through the slides. Um, so basically, I agree with everything that Gemma said. Um, so I was initially asked to address life as a clinician scientist with the objective being as follows, to encourage and inspire clinicians in medical students, junior doctors, etc., cetera, um, to entwine research throughout your career. So I think if you do that, you're going to be very busy, and I think that comment has already been made about Gemma. There's multiple aspects to it, and um, obviously not me, but um, I certainly remember having babies sort of sitting on my knee or doing whatever when I was trying to... Um, you know, finish off a research grant. Um, you do have a lot of balls in the air at different times, um, but I'd just like to say that that makes life interesting because I think if you're just going to be um, doing clinical work for the next sort of 30, 40 years, um, it, it isn't as exciting as what you think it might be. Um, you know, seeing people with high blood pressure, which is often what I do, or urinary tract infections, um, isn't that stimulating after, you know, 30 years of seeing people with hypertension or urinary infections. <laughs> it's better if you work in a hospital um, because it is sort of more exciting medicine, but I think a lot of people in um, primary care or in, um, in a specialist practice outside a hospital, it's sort of a lonely and a tedious life, I would suggest. Not that it isn't very good, but I think diversity is key to everything. Because at different times, one part of your life won't be going so well, your research mightn't be going so well, or you're really worried about a patient, and it's good to have a, um, a diversion that means that you're, you know, you stay engaged with what you're doing. Um, so um, this, I think, is a question that you know Gemma came up. You know, you're going on vacation, and then you know you're not going to bring work, but you do tend to. And unfortunately, NH and MRC grants, for instance, are always due in January, um, February, and we're always writing grants over the holiday period, um, which is something that you sort of get used to. It's going to change a bit, and I think um, NH and MRC has recognised that there needs to be some downtime. And when everyone else has got some downtime, you probably need to have some as well. Um, so I think everyone thinks, oh, I can't, you know, science is difficult. And I think when you've been a clinician, science is quite difficult. When I first started um, as doing my PhD, I, um, I had been what I thought was a great registrar. And, um, and I was sort of in charge. I knew what to do in most circumstances. And then I went into the laboratory and I put the, um, the capillary centrifuge tubes in the centrifuge upside down and, of course, blood went everywhere. And I was, you know, everyone looked at me, you know, all these junior techs and raising their eyebrows thinking, oh, well, we're stuck with her for how long? Um, but I think when you sort of come from being a, um, a clinician, your learning curve is quite steep. And so you start off feeling very challenged by um, the start of your PhD, but after you know you get through the middle bit, you actually realise you know what you're doing and that you can actually troubleshoot and work things out quite well. Um, but I think when you first be assigned, become a scientist, it is quite challenging. So prepare yourself for that. Um, so about me, I just loved being a medical student and being a junior doctor. So I, I've already told you I'm quite old. Um, and when I was a junior doctor, um, it, it wasn't anything like junior doctors are today where they get support and there's um, uh, you know, other more senior people around you in a hospital most of the time. So I remember being an intern, say, up in um, Kempsey, as being the only person in the hospital and uh, somebody was lynched. Um, uh, he was a boxer and he was lynched by a group of um, Indigenous people and then another group of Indigenous people cut him down and brought him into the hospital and I had to do a tracheostomy on him because he didn't have an airway. There was no other people in the hospital and about five minutes later somebody came in who had been glassed and her, I opened up her eye and her eye fell out and then somebody came in with an infarct and um, somebody else had a car accident and um, was... Uh, paraplegic and there was just me in the hospital. So those sorts of things don't happen these days, but I actually thrived on that. I thought, this is fabulous, you know. Um, I don't think I realised that it was actually dangerous. Um, and literally, I had the book out there thinking, I've got to miss the um, sub-laryngeal artery underneath the cricoid to do a, uh, um, a tracheostomy. 
So anyway, I sort of managed. I don't know whether he spoke again ever, but um, he um, he sort of seemed to survive. Um, so um, when I was a junior doctor and um, and a resident, I actually did publish quite a bit. Um, uh, Gemma made the point it's good to be first author. They've tried to change that a bit now for NH and MRC because. Um, uh, I think that research these days is such a collaborative effort that um, it's difficult to know whether the bioinformatician is the key person or the person doing the statistics or the person doing the basic science work, etc. There's always going to be a first author and there's always going to be a last author. But I think um, you know that idea when there's 30 people on a you know multiple site genetics paper um, that your position isn't going to be as highly regarded because your fifth or sixth author um, is sort of you know, falling by the wayside. So I think if you can be on any papers, that's that's a great thing. So, but you do have to actually justify your um, position um, in being on a paper. And now there's a move to actually say putting down your ten best papers or your ten best papers in the last ten years, um, and justifying what your role on those papers were, rather than somebody looking and saying high impact factor paper, first or last author, etc. Um, so I think any papers are, are worthwhile doing it. So I became a nephrologist by the time I was 28, and I know that's sort of a little bit uh, younger than what um, than what you know you guys will be looking at because when I did medicine, it was straight from school and it was a five year course, and I was pretty young when I started. Um, and then I finished my PhD by the age of 31. Um, at the time, there was this view that, um, you know, and I'm talking back in the 1980s when Mac classics were just, you know, my first papers were written on a typewriter with Letraset. So um, there, it took a long while to write a paper, particularly if you made a mistake because you had to write the whole paper again. Um, so, um, it, and when I did a PhD, most people did go overseas um, to do their PhD because there wasn't really a strong research culture, if you like, or, it, you know, it was almost like a cringe factor in Australia that you thought, well, I better not do a PhD in Australia. It won't be regarded quite so well. Whereas Gemma made the point about living on $10 a week. I think um, a PhD, no matter where you do it at a reputable university, is worth um, doing. And sometimes it's easier to do when you're at home because there's a big learning curve and if you like when you go overseas then you are um, you know replete with um, different skills that are you get better um, uh, experience and more out of doing a postdoc maybe than you do of doing a PhD overseas but everybody will have a different experience but mine was that I was married and it was easier for me to stay in Sydney um, than travel um, but I took um, the opportunity to do small trips overseas to multiple places to learn different techniques um, and that actually worked really well because I developed a research network in multiple places rather than just in one place um, that, and I still keep um, in contact with a lot of those people. And in fact, I send my PhD students or postdocs over to work with those groups, etc. Now, um, so I finished my PhD and then had my daughter. And then I realised I needed to do another experiment. It was the most difficult <laughs> experiment that I ever had to do um, because I thought it was all behind me. And so then I um, was lucky enough to be appointed as an academic. And if you are lucky enough to be appointed as an academic, that's fabulous because that means you get um, a protected research time as well as um, clinical time. Otherwise, like Gemma had to, you know, sort of be a staff specialist initially and try and keep doing um, work, which was, you know, all credit to her. But I think it's much easier when you get a fellowship or you're appointed as an academic. Um, and then I had my second daughter. Um, so I had, I had multiple mentors. Um, I had several women who were mentors, particularly Priscilla Kincaid-Smith, who um, you probably don't know, but she was the person who described analgesic nephropathy, which did account for about 35% of people with kidney failure in Australia at one stage in the um, 1970s. Um, and also Judy Whitworth, who um, who was dean of the um, of, of ANU at different and various other jobs in in H and MRC. She was the chief medical officer for the Commonwealth, etc. Um, I also got a lot of advice, um, and you don't need to listen to all of that advice. I mean, I was told that I needed to change the way I dressed if I was going to succeed. Um, yes, <laughs> Louise will be laughing. <laughs> But um, the person who told me to change the way I dressed was somebody who was in a bow tie at the time, and I thought, <laughs> you know, like really. Um, 
and and that I needed to have more gravitas um, if I you know like lower my voice and um, and try and project better and whatnot. Anyway, so that's why I'm saying I selectively listened. It was all meant you know in the best possible way, but I think sometimes you don't want to lose your individuality because somebody's t you know telling you how to change what your personality is. Um, so I missed a lot of things when I was um, a junior person, and I think if I went back, I would have been a lot better at particularly discovery. So when I was a registrar in ICU, um, we used to do um, CAVH, which was continuous arteriovenous hemofiltration. Um, and it relied on you having a decent blood pressure to drive the um, the blood through the you know dialysis um, membrane, and I did wonder whether or not we could connect it to an eye med, which is just like one of those um, you know a drip that goes at you know 80 mils an hour or 100 mils an hour, um, and to improve the filtration and um, reduce clotting, particularly when there was low flows. And anyway, I had to think about this, and then about five years later, Baxter brought in this you know what was CVVHD driving it on a, um, a venous pump, um, but with a pump in there, which was really my thought about the IMED. So I wish that I'd actually thought harder about it and um, you know had the right connections to actually do the engineering piece because Baxter made a fortune out of their CVVHD. <laughs> Um, then also in my PhD, um, I think um, it was mentioned that I looked at mechanisms of diabetic nephropathy and I demonstrated that if you inhibited sodium glucose transport, it resulted in um, renal protection in animal models of diabetic nephropathy. Now, everybody has an SGLT2 inhibitor. I mean, I'm talking, you know, 30 years later, but um, probably if I had recognised what was significant intellectual property at that time, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in the Bahamas or somewhere else. <laughs> um, so, um, it, you know, I published it and I nodded and I moved on. And, um, I, you know, now I think um, it's important that people recognise when there's potentially a, um, a an opportunity to, you know, do a make a patent and then progress that over the years. Um, but having said that, because of that, um, I guess, insight into the basic mechanisms, I have become an advisor for most of these companies that do have an SGLT2 inhibitor, and I'm on the steering committee of, um, of several uh, studies that are now going on in that space. Um, so because of that, I've sort of give talks, I think I've got about five to do at the next World Congress of Nephrology, half of them are about diabetes and SGLT2 inhibition and mechanisms and um, that results in a revenue that I can then um, put back into the laboratory to support my, my own students and my own postdocs. Um, so um, I, I actually really liked basic research. I mean, I think some people um, don't go into basic research. They go into clinical research because it's more akin to what your background training has been, you know, and if you haven't done any basic research, you don't know whether you like it or you don't like it. And clinical trials, et cetera, are something that, you know, everybody can get when you've done medicine. Um, so, uh, you know, I think if you get an opportunity to do some, it's good. And I think when you do a PhD, to do a clinically based PhD can sometimes be um, tricky because um, patients seem to dry up. You know, you think I've got 500 of these patients, but, you know, you ask them to be in a clinical trial and, you know, it takes twice as long as you think and you get half as many patients as you wanted. And so then your PhD sort of extends out. So um, I think, um, you know, think about what, you know, what you want to do, what extra skills you want to learn, um, and then what you can actually gain when you're actually, you know, doing um, your clinical job in years to come. An academic job um, gave me protected research time, I've already said that, and it's also, I've also been lucky to have continuous NH and MRC funding, um, as well as other funding, JDRF and juvenile diabetes and, um, and ARC funding. But I think that, you know, when you, when you start doing research and you start doing um, a, a senior clinical role, I guess a lot of people get concerned that um, if you do too much research, you might not be as good a clinician or people might not perceive you as um, being a clinician. So sometimes, you know, there's that old, if you can't do it, you teach, and if you can't teach your research or something like can't remember the exact thing. But, um, but I think one of the traps is that you then... Um, uh, 
do more clinical work than you need to do and that makes you three times as busy. So as an academic, I'm, I actually only need to do on a contractual basis an on-call of 0 0.2. But for the last, up until this year, I've done a full-time um, on-call uh, nephrology, dialysis and transplant roster. Um, which at different times over the years has been a one in two roster, particularly for transplantation. So I think um, don't feel like you've got to prove something if you know because I don't think you need to um, you know be as visible in all roles. Um, but having said that, I did um, want to get PhD students who were clinicians because they do have this um, need to finish within. A, a, you know, the, the minimum period of time, they're all very smart and they can sort of see the relevance. Not that people from a science background aren't, but um, they they sort of often haven't got a background in renal, for instance, which is helpful if you're working in my lab. Um, so uh, because I've sort of, um, that's been my approach to work, and obviously it's Gemma's as well, you, you are very busy, but that doesn't mean that it's not enjoyable being busy. I think if I wasn't busy, I would be bored. So I think, you know, like when you go for a run in the morning, you're thinking about, um, you know, maybe I should take a different tack on that experiment that I was thinking about yesterday. Um, so I have um, supervised 25 students um, and uh, they are from a diverse background which makes for a really good laboratory environment. So I've got endocrinologists who've done their PhD with me in um, basic mechanisms of say, um, you know, maternal transmission of chronic disease, um, uh, looking at diabetic models, etc. And I've got nephrologists and scientists and I learn a lot from my students. Um, and I think too, what's important is that if you have got a clinical practice, you've got a buffer for, for philanthropic funding. So I have a sign on my desk that says, ask me about my research. And if ever patients ask me about my research, I say, oh, look, I'm too busy, I can't possibly tell you about my research. Um, and so I ended up um, last year running a day where um, I got um, maybe the last 20 patients that I'd seen or that I thought of who'd actually asked me about my research, and I talked to them about my research. And I think I raised $255,000 on that afternoon tea from people who um, wanted to support me. And yesterday I had a patient hand me $75,000. So that makes for very good infrastructure for your laboratory, and that's a benefit for cl that clinician researchers have that scientist researchers actually don't have. And you be surprised the people that give you money are people that you wouldn't expect would give you money you know like the person who just lives alone in a modest house um, is much more likely to seemingly from my experience give um, more money t for research um, but I think you know they've obviously engaged um, so through that I do travel a lot and I quite enjoy that interaction um, I have had a significant involvement with the International Society of Nephrology, um, various office bearing positions which, um, you know, I'm sort of committed to their mission of um, advancing nephrology in the developing world. And so one of my jobs there was to look after Sub-Sahara Africa at one stage when we looked at acute transplantation in postpartum um, renal failure because there's a lot of it, unfortunately, you know, due to hemorrhage, etc. We organised for them to be acutely transplanted and um, so I think made a difference. Um, but through that, I've gotten to know nephrologists all around the world, and that means that when my children have travelled, I've rung up somebody in Colombo and said, "Look, my daughter's there. Do you mind just, um, you know, if she needs help, she can, you know, I'll give you your number." And that's meant that. You know, my kids have stayed with nephrologist kids all around the world and I've had people from Russia staying at my house for six weeks and I had a Rastafarian um, guy um, who, as a medical student um, and his girlfriend for eight weeks or so. But that's all fabulous. It's just it makes for a really nice community. And there's not that many nephrologists around the world that makes it um, untenable to be able to do those sorts of things. Um, so I've enjoyed all my clinical work. I really like my patients, or 90% of them, maybe 95. There's a few that you think, oh, I've got, I've got them again. Um, but I've um, and and I really like my laboratory. And I think it's really important, again, as Gemma said, to um, go to a laboratory that you think you'll be able to work in. Um, sometimes, you know, people have because there's a mentorship program as well that um, that we try and mentor people from outside our own laboratories so that then they can come along and say in a private you know, space, 
I can't stand my supervisor, they're driving me crazy. Um, and then, you know, I can sort of unpick that with them, um, you know, well, what's driving you crazy? And maybe it's, um, you know, well, it's just good to talk about it. You can sort of see how that works. But I think if you are thinking about going and working in a lab, go and see what the culture's like in the laboratory um, because it may be that, you know, one person came to me and there was a, a, there were a lot of overseas students and the English wasn't spoken in the laboratory. And so that meant that this person was terribly isolated um, because everybody else was speaking an, another language. Um, so I think I encourage everybody to try and develop a funding strategy and, you know, I'm there as a backup if I've got the money to support them um, because research is expensive, consumables is ex are expensive. Um, and so if one person is lucky enough to get a grant, then the overall strategy of the laboratory is that then, you know, we use different grants for different purposes. Um, and so, you know, we all try and support each other because a lot of the time there's just a year or two gap for people and you don't want them not to be able to keep working. Um, I almost had a crash in my laboratory at one stage there because everybody sort of, I think I got a reputation as being a family friendly sort of a PhD supervisor. And so um, I think people would come along and then say, well, I'm having twins, um, you know, in six months time. So oh, that's good. Um, and, um, and so we had, I think, about 12 children under the age of two at one stage. Um, but that meant that everybody would go and help pick up the children or, you know, if somebody was away because their child was sick, they feed the cells or they, you know, um, gavage the animals or, you know, it's, a, it's very much everybody's supportive. Um, we, we have a very clear view that our research needs to make a difference um, and um, I have a clear view that I need to be supporting my early career and mid-career researchers. So I never go first or last on a paper now um, unless I've written the whole thing um, uh, because it's more useful for my students to go first or last or my student to go first and my early career researcher or mid-career researcher to go last because although I said it doesn't matter so much, I still think that that's important. And I think too, um, we have a, a philosophy in the lab that being vulnerable is okay. So, um, you know, if something doesn't work, that's okay. You know, nobody's going to get cranky with you for stuffing up an experiment. Um, and partly because of that, I've often got people in tears in my office. Um, so I'm patting them on the back and saying it's all okay. Um, because it is quite stressful at different times when you're doing a PhD. You know, you spend weeks on a thing and then it doesn't work. Um, and it's okay if it doesn't work because if it doesn't work, that's why you're doing the research. Maybe it's that's the right answer that, you know, that's, you know, what you were researching actually isn't, isn't going to turn out to be a correct hypothesis. Um, now, as a consequence, maybe or maybe not, um, the people that train in the lab t tend to have stayed in the lab. So that means I've got quite a big lab. So I've got three postdocs who have now been supported to associate professor status, and I've got two early career um, NH and MRC uh, fellows in the lab. Um, and I've got three additional postdocs in the lab who are clinician scientists. In fact, one of my um, postdocs, who's now an associate professor, did nephrology training and then liked research so much she stayed in research rather than went back to do clinical medicine. Um, and so that's a very good person to have. And then there's a couple of people that we're currently supporting through immigration issues. Um, we also have a, um, a fair amount to do with um, our biotech and uh, pharma uh, colleagues. So, um, you know, I'm sort of quite, in, I think it's important that be, because our laboratory is really paid for with taxpayers' money, that we make it available to, you know, improve the economic value of the, the state, really. So we do have various partnerships. So I think it's important if you can, if you get opportunities to say yes to them because that again leads to diversification of your working day. So I've said yes to most things um, and I think I came up through that era where you had to tick the box and have a female on a committee. Um, it's not so much the case now, um, but I think I was sort of one of the relatively few junior female academics and so that I, you know, I'd be on every committee under the sun. But as a consequence of that, I've had some really interesting roles in terms of um, leadership positions in that I, um, I chaired the um, Clinical Excellence Commission and I was the inaugural chair for the Agency for Clinical Innovation. And then I, um, I was on the board of Northern Sydney um, 
uh, from 2002 to 2004, and then from 2004 to 2006, the um, health boards, be well, health districts became chief executive-led organisations, um, and so there was an area health advisory council that I chaired, which was a great job because as an advisory council, you had all care but no responsibility, so you could armchair around everything and didn't have to do much. But then they changed it back to being a board, and I became chair of the board when we were building um, this local hospital the new Royal North Shore Hospital as opposed to the brown one that Gemma was showing. Um, so that was like a $1.2 billion capital um, investment as well as we've, we had a $1.3 billion recurrent um, investment. So um, it's sort of quite a big responsibility but very interesting and, you you know, obviously learnt a lot about governance and um, how to deal with difficult people. Um, I currently chair the new... And, and then they changed the rules so that you can't actually work in the organisation and chair the organisation because the chief executive reports to the board chair now, whereas previously they reported to the ministry. Um, so that becomes a governance issue for me, for my clinical work, to be responsible to the chief executive and then the chief executive to be responsible to me. So um, I had to change that... Um, at the end of 2016 and I now currently chair the New South Wales um, Bureau of Health Information. I chair Kidney Health Australia which is also great because that's a community sort of based organisation and I'm deputy chair of the Organ and Tissue Authority um, in Canberra and I'm also on NHMRC Council um, so I have a role in deciding you know how research monies etc are spent. Um, I'm a director of a small biotech company and I started another not-for-profit company looking at um, trying to uh, commercialise research out of the health sector that I was encouraged to do so by the then health minister. I've mentioned I have advisory roles to pharma and biotech um, and I'm, I'm an international PI or sit on the steering committee of, um, of various clinical trials and I chair various research committees um, including the cardiovascular research network of which Gemma's a part of that the state government gave us $150 million for last year. Um, so I think remember friends and family come, um, become more important as life rolls on so you shouldn't um, you know like lose friends or not don't take time to see friends um, etc and I think family is very important because time goes quickly so pay as much money as you need to pay to make sure that your life sort of works for you. So at one stage I almost had a, a you know a, a Christmas, staff Christmas party for all the people that worked at my place. Um, then, and, and I, Gemma put up that slide about um, money. Uh, you get paid a lot of money anyway when you're a doctor, and it's how much do you need? Um, and so I think you know you have to have a nice life. And I think maintain strong mentors, and um, they might be people older than you, but sometimes they they're just from different industries. You know, like people who are engineers or have a different perspective. Um, resilience, Gemma already um, already mentioned. Um, and I think you need to be honest and constructive all of the time. Um, you know, some of the worst relationships I've seen with, um, you know, between researchers and between students and um, supervisors has been when people aren't honest and um, and that go works both ways. And I think if you can be constructive instead of saying, oh, you've, you know, stuffed up that again um, is, is very demoralising. Um, and when you're in the middle of a meeting, I think that the key is to speak first and then don't say anything else and then speak last because then you've controlled the agenda and you've wrapped up what the messaging is and um, and it doesn't matter so much what the middle of the meeting says and then you check the minutes. Um, so <laughs> additional, <laughs> additional courses are helpful. So the Australian Institute of Company Directors, um, I've and then I've done various other things, you know, project management, etc. that you can just do as modules, um, bus business principles, statistics, you know, those sorts of things that you think if I need something, just go out and do it. Um, interact with industry and talk to people and attend meetings both within your specialty but also outside of your specialty because, for instance, funnily enough, renal um, biology has a lot in common with uh, with cancer biology. Um, so cancer metastases seem to have the same mechanisms underpinning the changes that you get in chronic kidney disease. Um, Innovation comes from unlikely sources, so I think you know some of my patients have actually talked to me about this would be a good project. Can you do it? Um, and so I think that you know listen to what they're um, telling you, and contribute back to the world that feeds you. So do things like you know talk at meetings and whatnot, and don't become cynical because I've seen people when they get older in their profession, you know they get you know they don't like what they're doing anymore. 
um, and respect everybody's perspective, at least publicly, if, if not privately. So I was going to talk about two case studies, but I don't think I will in the interest of time. But basically, I was going to tell you about the my um, PhD. And this is because when I did my PhD, there were 35 millimetre slides. We didn't have PowerPoint. So I had to take a PowerPoint of my slides. And so this is just some things that I developed. Um, and uh, basically, you know, I've told you that they're now um, the biggest uh, drug class that's um, capitalised on the market. Um, so we won't go into all of that. And um, these are some of the areas that my uh, my lab still works in in terms of um, SGLT2 inhibition, and I'm um, on various steering committees. The initiating dialysis study early and late is actually a clinical study that I was the PI on, and it comes out of this sort of data um, that demonstrates that there was an increasing um, uh, trend to start dialysis earlier and earlier in the course of chronic kidney disease based on some uh, studies where they demonstrated that if you started dialysis early, you lived longer on dialysis. But that's, of course, confounded by a lead time bias because they might have started dialysis a year later and then lived for the same period of time. So we, um, we did a study that randomised people to starting dialysis early and late and made absolutely no difference to um, when they started dialysis, uh, to, to whether or not they survived whether or not they had cardiovascular disease, whether they had infections. All it did was cost more money, both for the government and for the patient. So now that trend has reversed. Um, and, um, and this was out of seminars in nephrology in 2017, um, saying that it was a landmark event in nephrology research and unlikely to um, uh, be repeated. Um, and as I say, the start of dialysis time is now sort of turned around in the US, um, turned around in Australia, um, and it, it made, it's made a material difference to the way that we practice. So I think if, you've, if you're wondering about a, um, you know, a clinical question that you can't find any evidence about, then set up a trial. I mean, it's, it, we, we had to get a lot of money for this trial, but we went to NHMRC, we went to Pharma, we went to the, the, um, the Australian Health Minister's um, advisory council, we went to the college, um, we ended up getting quite a bit of money. So would I do it all over again? What do you think? <laughs> yes, of course I would. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.